Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I hopefully it is afternoon, maybe early evening in in time zones. But hello, you're all very welcome to this uh, the second of the IAM 100 webinars. Um, Christian, if you could advance the slide, please. Thanks. So during the session today, we'll have a brief introduction. Um, and then Tara will uh, talk about the uh, IAN in a uh, bit more detail. Dave Finnis will talk about next steps. And then Max will talk about the bow wave effect. And as uh, Christiane said, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end. Um, so if we go to the next slide, please. Um, my name is Derek Wright. I'm currently the chair of the Insurance Accounting Committee. And together with uh, Dave Finnis, I was co-chair of the task force, as it would now be called, or the subcommittee that developed this uh, IAN. Um, also speaking today is Tara and Max, who are both um, vice chairs of the Insurance Accounting Committee. The, <laughs> like magic, it's got there. Um, so a, a bit about the, I, uh, the Insurance Accounting Committee. Um, this slide shows the current structure of the International Actuarial Association. It's been in place for a couple of years now, uh, which uh, coincided more or less with the uh, start of the pandemic. Um, I don't think those two things were connected, uh, but since this structure has been in place, we've not actually had an opportunity for any in-person meetings. And uh, previously the Insurance Account Accounting Committee um, was meeting, uh, at both uh, sessions each year and we have had virtual meetings we're hoping that we will be able to get back together sometime next year um, but as you'll see the insurance accounting committee is part of the impact function of the insurance account uh, of the IAA um, together with the insurance regulation and pensions accounting we have close liaison with the uh, IASB um, as it's developed the um, IFRS 17 and as it continues to uh, develop uh, accounting standards. The, uh, if we could move on please. The IAN um, is an education document. Um, in this instance, it's an education document on IFRS 17. Um, it is not an ISAP, it's not a, an international standard, uh, but it, it's not mandatory. It's not saying you must do things this way. Um, it's to assist actuaries in complying with the, <coughs> the actuaries, with the ISAP and for um, implementing IFRS 17. Um, it's been written as an education document. It gives as much as it can different uh, suggestions of different ways of adopting uh, the standard or implementing the standard, but without saying at any stage of time, you must do this or you must do that. Um, so very much an education note. It's up to every member association, the extent to which they adopt this note, whether they take it into their own education material or whether they uh, just use it to develop um, uh, their own documents, which could vary slightly. And I know different countries around the world um, are using it in different ways. The IAN did take time to develop, um, <clears throat> not as long as the uh, IFRS standard, but uh, it did take a number of years. And primarily uh, because we were having to wait quite often for the standard to move on for uh, subsequent um, uh, issues being exposed and so on. So we were always trying to keep up to date with the progress of the standard. But of course, it needs to be remembered that this document was written by volunteers. Um, and we had some, yeah, probably 50 or 60 people involved in the project over the years. I'm not going to name all of them, but I would like just to recognize the, the chapter leads. Um, <coughs> there are Henry Siegel, Ernst Bisser, Kurt Lambrecht, Simon Curtis, Tara Wolf, Brendan Council, Dave Finnis, Bob Nicholas, Gareth Kennedy, Grant Robertson, Doug Van Dam, and other people who 
provided a lot of assistance over the, uh, the time of the development, including Stefan Engelander, Jim Milholland, Bert Jay. And we always were given a lot of enthusiasm over the years from past chairs of uh, the Insurance Accounting Committee, Sam Gutterman, Francis Reut, and William Hines. So thank you to everybody uh, for their involvement uh, and efforts in getting this IAN uh, where it is now. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Tara to take us through what is this IAN, what's in it, and so on. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Derek. Uh, so as, as Derek has already covered, the IAN document can provide non-binding guidance um, and practical examples to help us as we work through our uh, journey to implement IFRS 17. Um, the, the IAN is drafted up in five key sections um, covering the general model approach, uh, variations to the, to the approach, including the VFA and the PAA. Um, there's a, a discussion of fair value, um, components uh, and then other IFRS 17 topics, um, including presentation and disclosure. So each section is split out into a Q&A format, so it's pretty easy um, to, to zero in on elements that are relevant to you on any given time and day. Um, there are 17 chapters in total, 252 pages of very exciting bedtime reading for those who are just dying to dig into the meat of IFRS 17. Um, but again, understanding that there are plenty of us who don't have time to, to get into all the pages, um, the, the document is very well split up to, in, into topics and you can really zero in on the elements that are important to you on, on any given uh, time or day. And hopefully this overview will help you uh, as you move forward in using the IAN uh, as you're continuing through your IFRS 17 uh, implementation journey. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, thank you. Um, we, the um, introduction in the um, section A of the IAN uh, go into some basic information about IFRS 17, um, provides an overview of, of the I IFRS standards journey um, and, and how the insurance contract standard came about, as well as a, a brief um, understanding of the, the principles of the measurements and disclosures that are required under, under IFRS 17. Um, uh, chapter, chapter one goes into classification. Um, so how do you determine whether or not a contract even belongs in the insurance contract standard? How do you qualify as an insurance contract? Um, and cover some key principles that may differ from prior uh, measurement models around contract boundary, um, elements of an insurance contract that need to be bifurcated out, um, separated and measured under different standards. Uh, and then also principles of aggregation, which are, are key to the, the measurement model under IFRS 17. Um, so this overview is, is useful in, in just you know, helping you get your arms around the IFRS 17 model um, in general. Then chapter two goes into the general measurement model. Um, it talks about how future cash flow should be estimated. It talks about the discount rate approach for discounting those, those future best estimate cash flows, uh, and then also the, the risk adjustment for non-financial risks, um, and then the, the contractual service margin and loss component. Chapter two covers the, the first of these in terms of, of how cash flow should be determined. It provides principles for uh, estimating future cash flows. How do you determine what cash flows are in, what cash flows are out? Um, and then cash, you know, whether or not you need to do stochastic modeling for certain types of products, it gets into all, all of that um, type of, of consideration that you would have when you're determining your cash flows. Um, so the, the in key considerations as you are, are reflecting on your products um, and, and the requirements for those products. Uh, chapter three gets into the discount rate. Um, so, you know, how are, how are you setting up um, discount rates, yield curves, uh, discounting for replicating portfolios and, and the like. So it, it covers the general principles um, for discounting. It gets into, it, you know, if you're in the variable fee approach or, or um, you know, discretionary participating features, you know, how should the, the discount rates relate back to those types of features in contract, 
in contracts, um, it talks about how do you, the, the two main approaches to developing a discount rate in terms of the top-down approach or the bottom-up approach, it gets into that. And then what do you do when you're thinking about, you know, how should illiquidity be allowed for? Um, what do we do when we don't have observable interest rates, ultimate forward rates, and, and those kinds of complications around how the discount rates are determined? So a, a useful comprehensive summary of discount rates um, is included in, in chapter three. Chapter four uh, moves into developing the risk adjustment. Um, so this is, this is a relatively new um, sort of component of evaluation model, if you want, the risk adjustment. Um, if, you, if you had fair value or if you had, um, if you had uh, solvency two, maybe you were accustomed to a risk margin before, but, but if, if you hadn't, then a, a risk adjustment for non-financial risks is a, is a new, um, a new uh, I, I guess, element of the model. And so there are a number of acceptable approaches to developing that, which are discussed within, um, within the note. Uh, so to give you a flavor, it's, it's certainly not um, comprehensive in terms of all the allowable models, but it does talk about the common ones um, and give good direction about emerging practice around the, the risk adjustment calculations. Uh, chapter five gets into the level of aggregation. Um, and, and this is a critical element. A, a lot of valuation frameworks are seriatim based, um, but within the within the IFRS model, all of the calculations happen at um, a unit, a IFRS group unit of account um, method. So, so you've got some aggregation going on. So it gets into, and this can, can be operationally quite difficult uh, because IFRS requires you to, to group contracts according to portfolios and according to profitability grouping so that you don't have, um, you don't have uh, onerous contracts or you know, contracts that are not profitable. Um, providing an offset to, um, by, the, by the profitable business. So you've got to split those out and that can be quite a challenging process that companies don't have in place. Um, so it gets into some of those discussions about how you might look at that. Um, and then also to the extent there are regulatory constraints that cause, um, cause certain contracts to, to be onerous, you know, how you can kind of get around that or how, do you, how that's treated, I should say, how that's treated for purposes of buy for us, it's all, covered in this chapter as well. So again, quite a good discussion of the, the relevant features there. Chapter six uh, gets into the CSM uh, and loss component. So arguably, you know, one of the most important chapters because the CSM amortization is the basis upon which we'll recognize um, uh, profits in, in, the, in the business. So very key area of focus for, for companies so, you know, how, how are you um, determining the coverage units um, for the CSM amortization is, is covered here. Um, and then of course, the, the reinsurance um, elements of CSM are, are quite complex and looking back to the direct contracts. So some of those interactions between the reinsurance CSM and the direct CSM are, are covered here. Um, so again, a very useful uh, chapter for for practitioners to, to refer to in terms of emerging, uh, emerging practice and, and, and you know, even just the most basic issues of, of how um, you know, companies need to be thinking about, about this contractual service margin. Uh, if we can move to, thank you. As you said, Derek, like magic. Um, so, Chapter seven uh, gets into the, the sh shortcut for um, short duration contracts, the, the premium allocation approach or the PAA. Um, so the, to the extent that contracts exist on the property casualty side, for example, that are one year in nature or on the life side, we have group life contracts that are also one year in nature. The, there's a, a possibility of not building out a full-fledged cash flow projection model um, for these contracts that are one year in nature, um, and and so you can apply you can apply to be um, eligible for use um, for uh, to use the, the PAA as a, a shortcut model um, for valuing these contracts, and and so the ideas about how you can um, achieve eligibility for this um, and, and and 
and initial recognition, subsequent measurement, some of the ideas around some DAC balances are, are covered in, um, in this chapter. So uh, quite a useful chapter for, for property casualty folks, I expect. Um, and then also some, some life, life folks as well. Uh, chapter eight moves into to contracts that have uh, direct participation features. So if you, this is a, gets into the variable fee approach. So if you've got contracts whose cash flows are impacted by the underlying assets, um, so think participating business, think variable annuity business, segregated fund business, um, this chapter is going to be um, of keen interest to you uh, to understand all, all the, the sort of unique items that have been built in for contracts that should be valued um, using the variable fee approach. Um, it, it's included here in chapter eight. Uh, chapter nine gets into reinsurance. Um, and, and again, um, potentially quite different from um, historical valuation models that may have been um, performed, you know, net of reinsurance under IFRS 17, reinsurance has to be valued separately. So you have a, a reinsurance gross up model that's required. Um, and, and as I sort of talked about earlier with the, some of the CSM uh, uh, interdependencies between direct business and reinsurance business, um, reinsurance can be quite a tricky topic. Um, you know, mapping many to one and one to many and all kinds of fun um, items that, that are coming up as we're implementing IFRS. And, and so this chapter covers that. Um, you'll, you'll see um, to the extent that there are reinsurance items that are specific to some of the other prior topics that I discussed, there's, there's reinsurance um, references and topics scattered back in the prior chapters um, as well. So, so you might want to use your um, your search function in the PDF to make sure you catch all the the good nuggets that are that are um, included in the in the note. Um, and then, of course, the the chapter nine uh, has the, the reinsurance specific discussion, which you'll also find quite useful. Uh, chapter ten moves. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, chapter ten talks about uh, fair value approaches. So fair value will come up um, in a, a couple of uses in IFRS 17 right now. Um, transition calculations, we're, we're just about a couple of months away from transition for many, many companies. So um, in, in, in the depths of fair value calculations for, for transition um, to the extent that that's applicable. Um, and then any um, other business combination type uses of fair value approaches are, are discussed here. Um, and then in chapter 11, there's a discussion of business combinations and portfolio transfers more generally and how IFRS 17 would apply to those. Um, so again, a big interaction between chapters 10 and 11 with the fair value and then the business combinations. Um, then when we look to chapter 12, there's a discussion on uh, transition. So, Again, at this moment, as I said, um, <laughs> a few short months away, a uh, flurry of activity ongoing in the industry around transition. So this, this chapter will provide a lot of, of good insights um, as, as we move up to the, to the deadline for many, um, for many jurisdictions, um, sets out the, pro the approaches for you know, full retrospective, modified retrospective fair value. They'll, they're all covered here in this chapter. Uh, so, so that practitioners can have a, a good feel for, for um, items to make sure that they consider. Uh, chapters 13 um, and 14 cover um, embedded derivatives and modification derecognition together, uh, sorry, respectively. Um, and so when we think of embedded derivatives, so there are certain um, changes to IFRS, what what types of features need are, are considered embedded derivatives and will need to be bifurcated and valued separately. Um, I think that has changed from prior valuation. You know, if you were on US GAAP previously, for example, there are some changes there that need to be considered that are covered off in chapter 13. Um, and then chapter 14, um, modification and, and derecognition. And you get into a lot of this with, with reinsurance contracts when reinsurance contracts are renegotiated. Um, 
then you've got to you've got to determine whether or not it should be derecognized and and then re-recognized or, or if it was all within the the realms of the contract boundary a lot of discussions on um, conversions and whether or not those are part of a long contract boundary or whether or not it's a new contract so a lot of good content in here um, that you might find handy as well uh, and then at the bringing up the, the tail of the, the note um, in chapters 15, 16, and 17, we've got um, uh, explanation of key terms, um, presentation, and disclosure. And typically we, we find ourselves um, you know, sort of leaving the presentation and disclosure to the accountants, um, but because the actuarial calculations are so critical, to you know, the different the different rows within the presentation and and to the disclosures, um, we felt that it was important to make sure we include um, the, these topics within the note and and we think you will find it very useful to have these these to hand because uh, in my life I find that things are <laughs> where things go wrong is where you know, one discipline meets another. So the actuaries meet the finance or the actuaries meet the accountants and there's something that falls in the, in the cracks. And, and that's, that's what we want to avoid, right? So having this, um, this information available to us so that we can educate ourselves and we can, and, you know, kind of overlap with the, the accounting folks rather than having a gap um, is critical. So those chapters are, are helpful in that respect. So that, is the that is the note in you know 15 minutes or less uh, so hopefully you found that helpful and i will turn it over to dave for uh next steps okay thanks tara thanks for that very succinct description very very impressive thanks um yeah i wanted to talk about next steps um for a couple of reasons i mean firstly as, as derek mentioned earlier we're very well totally dependent on volunteer effort for for anything we do in this area uh, what you've seen with iaen 100 so far is basically the, the latest step in the road if you like so we're, we're following along with the the ifrs development and and obviously as soon as the standard starts being enforced implemented then we'll have further things to do and and i've sort of split them into into three separate areas there's a uh, our traditional role, if you like, and as, as Derek mentioned earlier, we're part of the, the impact part of the structure of the, the IAA under the new restructure, but um, I prefer to think of our, our role more, more in terms of influence. I think uh, trying to bash up a few accountants is probably not a good idea uh, when, you, when you're when you talking about IFRS 17. So, so, but we do have an important role in, in influencing what is, as we all know, an actuarial model that the, the accountants are applying to insurance contracts. Uh, they may not be calling it an actuarial model, but, uh, but it is. And, and I think we've got a, a role there to monitor, maybe not go as far as police, but certainly monitor the way that it's being introduced and applied because there, there are obviously potential areas where those uh, principles that the IFRS are depending on maybe bent a little bit also and the second part is is looking around the world at the various member associations use of the of the draft ian as it was and now the uh, the final ian uh, there are various different um, approaches to that i mean some some member associations are basically totally dependent on the iaa for any educational support in in this area so for those, we, we may have a more active role to play as, a, as an international body. For others, they're, they're quite happy to provide the educational support with, with no real assistance from, from the international body. And there are probably those in between who are looking to use our IN100 as the sort of top layer of, of advice that they're, they're trying to provide their, uh, their members in the, in the local area. And then, of course, thirdly, there's the there's the means of improving practice and, and changing practice as it, as it develops in applying the standard. Uh, when we were talking in committee about what our next step should be in this role, we were mainly talking about examples. We, we've been very careful not to include too many examples in the note at this stage, because clearly we're really only guessing at, at this stage. But um, 
as we move forward, we see our role as, as actually providing more detail on the type of examples that will, that will help in advancing actuarial practice in, in all areas of the application of IFRS 17. And if we can move on, Christian, to the next slide. Uh, I just wanted, before passing on to Max, to talk about one of those examples, I did want to give you just a reminder about the additional background educational material that we, we have produced over the years uh, in the old, what, what used to be called the Education and Practice Committee, and, and as Derek said, will now be hopefully set up in form of task forces. But what the, what the old subcommittee has produced is a number of monographs uh, in addition to assisting with the, the production of the, of the ISAP 4, the standard, the monographs are really there as a means of uh, sorting out the, the mountains of actuarial material in the various areas. So, for instance, if you talk about stochastic modeling, you know, there's clearly more than one, one volume you, we, could, we could write on that. Well, what we've tried to do is focus in on the areas that will be useful for people who are looking at stochastic modeling as a way of producing future cash flow projections and so forth. So, so that book is, is worth referring to. As Tara said, we've, we've already got 250 odd pages in the notes. So we're not going to force anybody into reading this stuff, but we just to let you know it's there as well. We've also got a note on, on risk adjustments, which was again focused on the, the use under the, under, the, uh, under the new standard. And, and a few years ago, we produced um, a monograph on discount rates. And I, I just wanted to mention, unfortunately, we, we recently lost rather suddenly David Congram, who was very, very active in the, in the production of that note. And uh, we, I just wanted to remember him as, uh, as providing just a, a massive input in that area. Okay, with that, I'll, I'll move on quickly to Max. Max, as I say, wanted to talk about one of the types of examples that we, we may be developing moving forward. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Yeah, one of these uh, one of these things is uh, something that we detected when working on the standard uh, in the practice in the in, our, in the German association. But this is something that I think that is uh, might might be relevant or is, from my point of view, relevant also uh, in the international community. Um, it's a so-called bow wave effect, and uh, in the course of the of the next few minutes, I think you will understand what is meant with it. Um, maybe go to the next slide. So the, uh, the, the, the bow wave effect is something that, uh, that it can be observed when it comes to, to typically participating in life insurance contracts that are measured under the fair value approach. And um, there, uh, as you uh, most likely will know, there we have the, the, the topic of the unlocking of the CSM and um, the crucial part for the profit recognition of the PNL is, of course, the, the, uh, uh, the, yeah, the, the, release, the release of the CSM over the whole lifetime of the, of the contract. And uh, if we want to, to talk about this bow wave effect, then we have to do some recap on, on the unlocking first. Otherwise, it's really hard to, to understand uh, how, how this effect uh, yeah, arises. Yeah, basis is the, the underlying item, which is the pool of uh, uh, assets or something like uh, everything that generates value from a contract, the pool of value generating items, that's in my, in my wording, um, that, that is covering the liabilities and it's also uh, producing the, the, the money for, uh, for, for the fulfillment cash flows going forward. Um, we have to look in, in all the pools uh, and this, uh, the relevant part of this underlying item is not the underlying item itself, but the fair value of the underlying item. So we have to, to concentrate on the, uh, on the fair value of underlying item and it's rather irrelevant what the underlying item actually is, but of the fair value of the underlying item, that's a relevant piece of it. Uh, the development of the uh, fair value of the underlying item is more, so you see in the middle, this is the, the more or less a savings account. You have a starting account value, then you have some, some returns coming in, some inflows coming in, and some outflows going out, and this determines the, the, the fair value at the end of the period. That is rather simple. So when it comes then to the CSM unlocking um, effect, um, there we see uh, what, what has to be unlocked. Um, it's the change in the fair value of the underlying item, as explained uh, already. 
um, minus uh, the, the change in the fulfillment cash flows during the uh, during the the, the, the period uh, to be yeah to be observed or to be measured. And uh, that's that's uh, that's uh, the thing how it is defined in the standard. So it's the delta of the fair value of underlying items minus the delta of the fair value of, uh, of the fulfillment cash flow that has to go to the CSM at the end of the period. And so, and then what is now the bow wave effect itself? When uh, we, if we go to the next slide, yeah, here we see it. So you see this uh, in, uh, impressive ship. At least for me, it's impressive uh, coming from Bavaria, where there is no edge to the sea, um, uh, and uh, you see uh, piling up some water in front of of, of this big uh, of this big uh, vessel there that is um, yeah that is cruising over over the sea. So what are we doing in the what are we doing in, um, in the fair, fair value approach um, or when valuing the, the liabilities? Um, typically, we have a market consistent valuation approach where we have all these uh, financial mathematical requirements uh, such as arbitra arbitrage free uh, assumptions and so on, arbitrage free uh, modeling and so on and so forth. And uh, this is necessary uh, for valuing the, 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 the options and guarantees that are embedded in the, in, in the liabilities in, in these participating contracts. For, for, for theoretical reasons, typically you have to rely on this uh, risk neutral valuation methodologies with some extensions on liquidity premiums, uh, but in general it's, it's this uh, risk neutral approach that you see there. And um, but uh, that's the theory how you measure the liability. On the other hand side, in reality, you observe that you get over returns coming from 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 credit spreads or coming coming from 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 uh, assets such as you know, stocks that you own and and so on uh, shares in, in your portfolio, and this is you expect you see in reality an over return rising more or less each and every year, and. Um, yeah, due to the methodology as described above, um, this discrepancy, this, uh, this delta has to go to the CSM. And uh, by doing so, this, um, these over returns pile up uh, from year to year in the CSM and lead to a definitely uh, end loaded uh, profit recognition pattern. Despite the fact that this is um, that you have a, 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 a release pattern of the CSM as the, uh, defined um, at, at inception of the contract. And uh, there you see this, this discrepancy. Um, the recognized CSM is as, as, um, yeah, as you expect at the beginning, but then you have these over returns that are postponed to the future and come uh, to the PL in the end. Going to the next slide, there we see um, yeah, what we what we then realized is that neither the, the standard itself or any other sources from the ISV address this type of effect because it's something that is that is outside outside financial theory, but it's reality. And so the, we have the problem that reality does not fit to the theory. Uh, typically, this is a problem of the model and not a problem of the reality. But um, we can uh, we can uh, uh, we have to deal with it nevertheless. And. Uh, yeah, so uh, what we what we uh, then uh, have to think about how to deal with it, because typically um, I think something like the bow wave effect coming from these um, uh, from these uh, real world over returns, but also from the release of the uh, time value of options and guarantees that is also put into the uh, in the into the uh, into the unlocking of the CSM, they are not intended, definitely not intended in uh, when when uh, the, the standard. Was written and to come to this uh, uh, yeah, end loaded profit pattern, and for, uh, while uh, and then of course when we want to deal with it, then we have to think about practical solutions for this. And uh, from from uh, from my point of view, there are actually two uh, alternatives that we see on the next slide. Uh, the first one is uh, yeah, to calculate something like a shadow CSM, real-world shadow CSM, and uh, that uh, is based on the expected over-return on, on the long run, or also the, the expected uh, release of the time of options and guarantees. And uh, you um, calculate and you then uh, put into the, into the profit recognition of each and every year this, yeah, the release of this shadow CSM. That's one approach. 
The other approach would be to say um, to, to determine the, the expected credit spreads for the next year and also the expected release of the TV uh, time value of options and guarantees. And you additionally put this into the, in the profit recognition of each and every year, which then would result in a, in a release pattern of the CSM, of the original CSM as um, intended or as expected in the, uh, at the beginning, at the inception of the contract. And uh, from year to year, you you will see this uh, this expected over return, and also in the PNL, but and not in the in a recalibrated unlocked CSM. Yeah. So we uh, the next slide gives some illustration to this to this uh, to this uh, approach two, which is the um, here you see the, the, the diagrams in the middle. You have the CSM at uh, in at, at Time. Uh, at the beginning of the period, CSMT, you have an um, expected uh, CSM at T plus one. Uh, you realize this is the dark blue, the dark blue bar. Then you have an expected over and you have an over return in the current period. Um, if you do nothing, you realize the, the gray shaded uh, area in the PNL and also some some part of the over return in the PNL. And put the rest of the over return to the to the CSM at a period t, uh, at time t plus one, which then gives this O wave here uh, for one period. And the alternative would be really easy to see in the, on the right hand side. You you take the full uh, you take the full over return of the period into the PNL, and you you end with the CSM at t plus one, as it was expected um, uh, at the beginning of the period. So these are, this is one uh, approach that is possible uh, from my point of view, and uh, that we also then discuss in, in already in, in, uh, in German uh, society, but also in the IA, we had some, some first discussions around this. And um, as David uh, already mentioned, this could be something where we, uh, from, from, the, from the IA, um, uh, yeah, put some, 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 some documents, some writing, some, uh, some illustrations and some guidance around uh, uh, going forward when it comes to the further development of IRFOS 17. So that's, and having said all this, I would hand back to Derek, I think. Thanks very, <clears throat> thanks very much, Max and uh, Tara and Dave for the presentation. There is an opportunity for questions um, either through the Q&A or through chat or raise your hand. The only comment we've had so far is from Ralph uh, reminding uh, people that the PAA uh, can apply to contracts beyond uh, one year, not just one year contracts, uh, of course, subject to being able to demonstrate that that um, gives a similar answer to the uh, uh, general uh, method. Um, so thank you, Ralph, for reminding us of that. But, but does anyone else have any questions or comments they uh, want to to raise? And a question that was raised the other day um, was: Is um, IFRS seventeen mandatory? Uh, does every insurance company in the world have to adopt it? And the answer to that is no. Um, much as it uh, was always designed to be a global standard with the hope that most countries would adopt it, um, it is down to each country as to um, what it does and how it adopts uh, standards. Uh, the EU is, um, uh, is going through a, uh, a process um, around endorsement. Um, and it is proposing a carve out um, in, in respect of uh, the VFA business um, for the uh, not having to go for annual cohorts. But that will only apply to companies regulated in the EU who operate only in the EU. If they're subsidiaries of, say, an American company, they will have to follow the, the standard being adopted elsewhere. Um, and different countries around the world um, uh, can uh, will have their own process for adopting standards. Um, there is a question that's come through 
And Max, maybe you might like to well, let's have a look at it. Is the bow wave effect going to be analyzed in a future IEN? Or is there any material to review it in advance? Um, as Max said, and Dave alluded to, it, it has been discussed and will continue to be discussed um, in the Insurance Accounting Committee. And we are looking to be able to publish a paper in some, uh, in some form uh, to discuss this and give more detail. Um, and uh, Christian, no? uh, so Max, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think um, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, things to add to what you said. Um, okay. We we did some we did some uh, we produced some so some some texts and some papers in the German actuary association that is um, I think available on the on the German uh, the web page of the German association already. Um, I would I would be happy to, to share this link. Then there you can see. Uh, so some some uh, more detailed description of these effects. Um, it's embedded in a, in a rather comprehensive document of 60 or 70 pages, um, but only five or six are dealing with this effect. And uh, that is something I could offer and uh, to, 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 to spread this link of, of, of this particular working group. But uh, at, at the moment, there is nothing more available, at, to, at least to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. We There is a, a question here in which countries will actuaries have a statutory role in IFRS 17? And I suppose my answer to that question is, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I, I know in the UK, they won't have a statutory role in IFRS 17, but they're, um, they're, it is expected that every, well, every company must have a chief actuary and that chief actuary will be involved in it, but it's not sta a statutory role as such. I don't know if any of the other panelists want to add any more to that. Do any countries you know where there is a statutory role? In yeah, Derek, IFRS 17. <laughs> yeah, just, just quickly, Derek, that there are countries, as I say, around the world that really haven't got um, a lot of support to their actuarial function. And, and in those cases, the, uh, the, the supervisors have been leading the way, so to speak. So there's more potential from, from those countries, but none I'm aware of yet where it's actually been incorporated into the, the statutory role itself. Tara, yeah. anything to add? Well, I was just gonna, and, and Ralph's chiming in too, um, that in Canada, IFRS is gonna be the statutory framework. So clearly there's a, a role to the, the actuaries are gonna play in these countries where IFRS is the statutory framework, but whether or not it's like an approved actuary or appointed actuary requirement that you, you probably have to go country by country to get exactly what the, the role of the actuary is in terms of signing versus just you know, setting up best estimate assumptions, et cetera. And the IFRS 17 task force of the IAA uh, did put together a note, um, probably uh, went out a year plus ago, um, which, which went to a number of regu regulatory bodies and to uh, large accounting firms, encouraging the uh, greater use of actuaries in the production of IFRS 17 and the auditing of IFRS 17. Um, Christian, I am assuming that that um, note the task force developed is actually on the IAA website. Yes, that's correct. It would be available uh, as well on, <laughs> under publications uh, section, probably in the papers as well. Um, I can probably link to it. I'll, let me just find it. I'll, I'll link to it in the, uh, in the chat. Thanks very much, Christian. Uh, another question, what are your views on where companies are at in terms of implementation? And do you see any further delays in IFRS 17 coming into force? <laughs> um, I think that's wishful thinking that there'll be any more delays. Um, I don't believe there will be, but um, other panelists? <laughs> I think it would be good for consulting companies <laughs> if there would be a further delay. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to point out that Tara works for a consulting firm. <laughs> But uh, right. apart from, from, from that wishful thinking of some <laughs> participants, I think um, I don't see any further delay. Yeah, I don't either. And it is a mad scramble to the finish line, right? And, and 
I guess the other thing too is you've got like a there's waves too um, because you've got the companies that are going to do public reporting which have one timeline and then different statutory jurisdictions have different timelines that are going to come later i've got one client that i'm working with they have local regulatory and shareholder reporting and they've got different transition dates that they're dealing with so the, the, so they're going to have two transitions that they're going to check i mean it's a very hairy situation right now <laughs> i would say out there yeah and, and there's a lot of variety in the uh within jurisdiction as well as across jurisdictions in, in terms of preparedness, of course. And, uh, you know, we don't really find out how well people are prepared until, uh, until they actually start reporting on the basis of IFRS 17. But I agree, I, I can't see any more delays now. Co COVID was the perfect excuse and nobody seems to have used it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, with, <clears throat> with everyone working from home, they have more time to be able to, um, <clears throat> Uh, implement IFRS 17. I'm surprised it wasn't brought forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a question, uh, can these notes, I assume uh, is meant by that, the IAM 100, be used as a good starting point in articulating the main uh, IFRS 17 requirements for my company? Um, as I think was uh, um, in, in an answer to a different question, uh, we, the IAA, are very happy for IAN 100 to be shared to as many people as possible. Uh, but it, it, it should be remembered, as we've stressed a couple of us, that it is an education document. It doesn't actually set out how you must do things. It's just suggested ways that you could do something. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, any last comments that any of the panelists want to make? Okay, so thank you everybody um, for attending and um, I hope you found it useful. Uh, the document is available on, on the uh, IEA website. Um, there was reference to it in the slides earlier and uh, the Christian has put up uh, the um, Docu the reference to the documents I was mentioning about the I from the IFRS 17 uh, task force. So thanks everybody, enjoy the rest of your day.